Thank you, Yelena, and I'd like to say thank you to the organisers uh, for inviting us and also for creating space for this very important um, kidney disease. It's probably the most devastating disease I've ever dealt with. So um, I'm going to just start by highlighting four cases uh, that we've dealt with at GOS. And then Dean will take over from me talking about his experience with preemptive strategies alongside LDL phoresis. And Anya will give her personal perspectives on LDL phoresis at Evelina. So um, we all know that FSGS is one of the most leading causes of childhood renal failure. It tends to recur in about 50% of, uh, pe of pediatric renal allografts. And when it does recur, it's one of the major causes of graft loss in children. And as you can see, this graph here it highlights that the recurrent group in particular have a very poor five-year renal survival. And therefore, every strategy available must be at least attempted to try and get on top of this disease when it does recur. So what are the risk factors for recurrence? Well, less than six years of presentation, those presenting with a rapid progression towards end-stage renal disease. Some reports have suggested that diffuse mesangial proliferation in the native kidney is a risk factor. We all know that recurrence in the first allograft is associated with 80 to 100% recurrence in the second allograft. And more recently, um, the lack of identification of a mutation in at least 70 known genes associated with steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, it puts, the, puts patients in the higher risk category. And Anya, you were uh, involved in a very important paper in Jason in 2014, which highlighted um, the problem with patients who develop secondary steroid resistance. So that's about 10% of cases as being a major risk factor for recurrence of disease. So the first case is that of a congenital uh, nephrotic syndrome um, patient who had a mutation in the C-terminus of nephrin, which lies just at the base of the podocyte foot processes. And most of these patients undergo bilateral nephrectomies in our center. Uh, they then embark on peritoneal dialysis and this case received a living donor transplant, which had a pretty good match. And as you can see, um, serology uh, was, um, the donor was CMV negative, EBV pause in the recipient, CMV neg and, the, and EBV neg. So very unusually, um, we saw recurrence in this patient at day seven. And interestingly, we were able to get on top of this recurrence fairly promptly by initiating plasmapheresis, um, which in our center we treat with 10 successive sessions of plasmapheresis and then wean that down to thrice the set subsequent week and weekly for the last week. And this patient received eight, uh, eight weeks of oral cyclophosphamide and rituximab and the disease never recurred again. So I think this case highlights basically that even though we say a negative genetic screen, we all know that the congenital nephrotic patients uh, have been reported to have an anti-nephrin antibody, which can, in a subgroup, cause recurrence. But as you can see here, this uh, was easily managed, and Anya will have present a similar case uh, that, again, was easily managed. But this case does provide evidence that there are certainly um, circulating factors which seem to be associated with podocyte dysfunction and hence early onset of proteinuria after kidney transplant. And of course the other lines of evidence have come from uh, the fact that proteinuria in infants of mothers with FSGS due to antibodies against neuroendopeptidase, which lies at the bottom of the foot processes. And you can give rodents uh, proteinuria when you treat them with plasma from patients who've had a relapse. And of course, the remission after plasmapheresis or immune absorption supports the hypothesis whereby removal of the circulating factor seems to help those podocytes recover. And of course, you can have recovery in a retransplanted kidney to another recipient, um, again, uh, suggesting that circulating factors play a major role in the pathogenesis of this disease. So what are the protocols that are available? Well, you can give pulsed methylprednisolone, just 
three pulses over three, uh, one pulse over three days. Whether you do that successively over subsequent weeks will be discussed in my subsequent or subsequent talks. High dose calcineurin inhibitors, whether we do that with oral tacrolimus, oral cyclosporin, or IV cyclosporin, and I've got another case to show you uh, where we did achieve remission with that strategy. As I mentioned, oral cyclophosphamide, plasmapheresis, rituximab, and another B cell depleting agent like ofatumumab has been described to have effect, immune absorption, and LDL phoresis. So this was a case um, from a living uh, donor recipient who presented on day two post-transplant, having progressed to end-stage renal disease with eight months of treatment, whereby she recurred by evening of day one. And as you can see here, in the yellow shows a, a, a very fast fall in her albumin. And by day three, she was in full-blown relapse, so we initiated prompt plasmapheresis. And we did that over, as I mentioned, 10 successive days. And this was associated with a high urine albumin creatinine ratio. We then gave her rituximab, 750 milligrams per meter squared at the end of the 10th successive day. And we left her on oral prednisolone over the first month at a milligram per kilo per day, alongside MMF at 1200 milligrams per meter squared per day, divided in two divided doses. And we gave her IV cyclosporin the day before she went into theatre. She had a 12-hour trough CSA level of 200 nanograms per mil. And I'd like to just point out that did not prevent the recurrence. We left her run on IV cyclosporin for the first week with uh, levels at least 200 to 350. And then we switched her over to oral cyclosporin for the following three weeks. And she was in remission by the 14th day. Uh, post-transplant. So her baseline creatinine by month three was 56, at which point she was on oral tacrolimus. Now the next two cases um, will reflect uh, what's reported in the literature. So we know that we can prevent or we can treat remission in about 50% of cases, but there are obviously the other 50% who we don't always get into remission. And how, do we do, how can we do better with this group? So case three is that of a boy who presented at the age of eight years. Um, he presented with a colitis and within six months was diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome. In October 2014, he had a kidney biopsy which showed collapsing FSGS. And you can see this uh, feature here on the right. He had comorbidities which were treated. These included hypothyroidism and he was treated with statins for hyperlipidemia and this was in another center. He was uh, maintained on combination tacrolimus and MMF. He was given four doses of rituximab, 375 milligrams per meter squared per dose over four weeks. He then um, went on a trial of plasmapheresis when he did GF4 greater than 60. However, he progressed towards end-stage disease and ended up needing bilateral nephrectomies and was started on nocturnal hemodialysis. So he received a kidney from his father and uh, by day two again had recurrence. The UAUC a time of recurrence was 3,600 milligrams per millimole and he had uh, basically um, oliguric, allograft, uh, acute kidney injury within the first three days. His creatinine remained high throughout the first four weeks of his recurrence and his albumin uh, was in the low 20s. So his CNI levels, he was on oral tacrolimus going into the living donor uh, kidney transplant because he had IBD. And as you can see here, uh, by day 9 and 10, his tacrolimus levels were between 8 to 10. And he received three pulses of methylpred and prednisolone of one milligram per kilo per day. And the prednisolone was weaned because uh, he did, was not tolerating high dose oral steroids uh, because he was having nightmares and night terrors. So his prednisolone was weaned down. We also treated him with plasmapheresis, and in fact, by day five of his recurrence, um, we gave rituximab with 24 hours of plasmapheresis. 
The dose of rituximab we gave was 375 milligrams per meter squared. We had B cell depletion within 22 hours of plasmapheresis. And then we continued his plasmapheresis protocol for a further five days and weaned that plasmapheresis to alternate days over the ensuing weeks. But as you can see here, by day 30, the urine albumin creatinine ratio, um, whilst better, was still in the region of 1,000 milligrams per millimole, and his albumin remained uh, just below the lower limit of the normal range. By day 42, which was week six, he had a kidney biopsy, at which point his creatinine was 246 and the albumin was 30. And there was no morphological evidence of FSGS, and that's concordant with what we hear in the literature. But on electron microscopy, there was diffuse foot process effacement. So we continued with plasmapheresis, and by the end of uh, the third month, we started to run, to run into problems with fluid overload, at which point he was requiring hemofiltration. And alongside that, um, we noticed that he was developing progressive head and neck edema. Um, and he had a CT venogram, which uh, we were sorry to learn that he had basically uh, evidence of SVC obstruction. So at that point, on liaison with our transplant surgeons, we felt that it was more causing more harm than good to continue the plasmapheresis. And we had a team discussion about what options uh, we could propose, and we considered the use of LDL pheresis. But this patient did not have any good vascular access apart from a left femoral vein, which we did not want to compromise further. And his parents were not keen on the concept of high dose steroids with uh, the use of LDL pheresis. So the current situation was by month nine, we did a second biopsy. This time it showed morphological evidence of FSGS. We tried a, a second rituximab uh, at 750 milligrams per meter squared on the basis of lack of chronicity on the biopsy. However, that did not work. And by month 11, post-living donor uh, transplant, we started peritoneal dialysis. And then this is just the last case leading into Dean's talk, just to highlight um, the situation with a fourth case whereby Again, uh, following progression from the recurrence of a disease in the first transplant, a fourth patient received a kidney transplant, and this also was associated with the immediate recurrence of the disease, which did not respond to plasmapheresis, cyclophosphamide, or rituximab. So I'm going to leave you with this case so that we can now learn from Dean about some preemptive strategies that are worth considering. Thank you, Anya. Um, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure. I realise we're short on time, so I'm just going to blast on through, and I'm going to keep this very heavily clinical. Then I'm going to leave Anya to do the clever stuff. Um, so I work in Manchester, and I became interested in this therapy when I was facing a very difficult case, and I remembered a previous case. It's been discussed before that I mentioned, um, and I've worked with Anya before, and she'd mentioned this potential treatment, and I remembered it when we ran into difficulty with this case, and I followed it and chased it down. So. It's no, it's no over-exaggeration to say it's a nightmare, recurrent FSGS in a transplant. It's, you know, it's not untransplantable. What do we do? We go and transplant, of course. But it is, it is horrible for the parents, not only the physiological demands upon the patient, but also the emotional ones as well. And it's minutes to months, all the way from proteinuria to severe nephrosis, ATN, AKI. So what are our options? So you've heard from Anya some of the standard therapies, plasmapheresis, different immunosuppressions. Can we mitigate it by preconditioning, by giving them treatment prior to the transplant to do this? So we looked at our patients over a two-year period, and we had um, four patients with SNRS, FSGS, and biopsy, non-genetic variants, having been screened by the Bristol um, panel, age range 6 to 17 years, and two had already previously lost a transplant as a result of their condition. And we preconditioned with the rituximab early, two to four weeks prior to transplant. We gave four exchanges of plasma exchange in the week leading up to this, and all of these children had early disease recurrence at two to 26 day range. Three of, out of four of them went into remission with plasma exchange, complete or partial, quite quickly, and one continued on and lost their graft at five months after this, after a total of 56 plasma exchange sessions, you know? Got to realize something's not working here. And at 30 to 60 month of follow-up, one was in complete remission, two still are only in partial remission, with an EGFR range of 45 to 104. We just submitted this to Peter Neff this month, so our feeling very much about our center trial, experiences preemptive preconditioning does not work in these children preventing graft recurrence 
So what is the evidence of dyslipidemia in treatment in nephrotic syndrome? Well, there's lots of experimental uh, data in animal models and human models that actually addressing dyslipidemias reduces podocyte injury. It's known to be directly nephrotoxic in experimental data and clinically as well. And that's all the way from albuminuria reductions to reduction of actually podocyte numbers in the urine as well. So taking this on further, I became aware of the actual subbits of ldl a and I looked into it. And it's not a new technology, it's been around since the 1970s, but refined over the years. And I think we've all heard of it in the context of familial hypercholesterolemia and the treatments for that. But this is specific low-density lipoprotein apheresis, a very specific removal, which doesn't affect serum um, uh, HDL cholesterol levels. It selectively removes LDL cholesterol, VLDL cholesterol, and circulating triglycerides. And I became aware through conversations with the American trial team of a protocol that was being used in an American trial, which has been standardized to put people into remission post-transplant um, FSGS recurrence. And as you can see here, it's an LDL therapy, which I'll show you in just a second, and it's two sessions a week for the first three weeks, followed by one session per week for the next six weeks, a total of nine weeks and 12 sessions. And at week three, we begin some concomitant immunosuppression with pulsed intravenous methylprednisolone and oral deriprednisolone between that for the duration of the therapy with a weaning schedule. And this is what it looks like. It looks a bit more complicated than your standard dialysis machine. That's my day job. I'm mostly a CKD dialysis consultant. And it's a little bit of a difficult thing to put together, but our nurses um, learnt it with a plum. We have a standard plasma fractionator, like a hemodialysis filter. And then the plasma, uh, the separated fluid, is passed through these dextran sulfate columns, which are negatively charged and selectively attract low-density lipoprotein cholesterol to them and do not remove anything else and return the normal plasma back to the patient. So you can already see the difference between this and plasma exchange where everything is removed. It's a sledgehammer to break an egg. And we do about 60 mils per kilo, two thirds circulating plasma volume, takes about three hours per session and is associated with, with minimal side effects compared to plasma exchange. And as I said, she has no effect on the circulating HDL cholesterol levels. And that's just a, a brief graphic showing you the actual attraction of VLDL cholesterol and ApoB lipoproteins. <clears throat> so, on to the cases quickly. So, case one, post-transplant recurrence rescue. So, we had a five-year, eight-month-old male child who presented at age two with steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, and he had bilateral sensorineural hearing loss. His biopsy in April 2015 showed minimal change disease. Had we biopsied him again later, before end stage, it would undoubtedly show an FSGS. Um, and he went to end stage renal failure within one year of presentation, having demonstrated steroid resistance and second-line agent resistance as well. He went on to PD initially and was changed to hemodialysis with bilateral nephrectomies, and his kidneys at nephrectomy just showed end-stage sclerotic changes. This case was complicated by concomitant child protection concerns, and we'd screened him genetically as well for all the known mutations, which were 70 at that time on the Bristol steroid resistance screen. Finally, father came forward as a liver-related donor transplant and so we preconditioned him at that time, as we did in our soup center, with the rituximab and plasma exchange. And his course was complicated by severe hypersensitivity reactions with raised mast cell tryptase and IgE. We thought he was having dialyzer membrane reactions, and we switched dialyzers over, and it still continued to happen. We felt it was possibly plasma exchange related. His first and second dates were canceled because of infective complications, in part related to the preconditioning immunosuppression. But we finally went forward on the 21st of June 2018. It was a well-matched um, liver-related donor from father, 111 mismatch, um, EBV and CMV positive to negative, single artery in vein, and uncomplicated transplant, immediate passage of urine on the table. And we use a standard twist immunosuppression protocol in Manchester, which is basiliximab tac, MMF, and a five-day steroid withdrawal. The aftermath. Day two, he developed acute oligoanuria and severe. And the ultrasound had shown that he might have a perinephric hematoma, so concerned about an astomotic breakdown. He was taken to theatre and re-explored, and there was no hematoma around the kidney. But an open biopsy at the time showed that he had a severe ATN and a urine protein creatinine ratio of 800 at the time. And he went on to require isolated daily ultrafiltration in intermittent HD over the next few weeks. And we commenced immediate post-operative plasma exchange in the intensive way that Anya outlined before and pulsed intravenous methylprednisolone. We'd already B-cell depleted him, and he'd already had plasma exchange before that as well, to bear that in mind. And what this graph shows here is just the plasma exchange schedule alongside his serum creatinine. So you can see that his initial 
acute kidney injury resolved after a couple of weeks of the plasma exchange therapy. But what I can tell you as well is that when you compare that against his urinary protein levels, we could not switch off his nephrotic syndrome with a plasma exchange. The nephrosis continued. We'd mitigated and modified a circulating factor toxicity, but not really doing anything to his nephrotic syndrome. So he's miserable, volume overloaded, ultrafiltration dependent, dependent on multiple human albumin solutions and intensely immunosuppressed. So this just summarises what I've just told you there. I remembered the cases we discussed previously when I worked in London with Anya, and I went about procuring this machine from the Kanika company uh, at their centre in Germany. It took several weeks, and while I was waiting for that, I tried our standard lipid apheresis machine, which removes all lipids from the bloodstream while I was using that in the meantime, because we have one of those for familial hypercholesterolemia. And we started the liposorber therapy in August of 2018. And just to show you the same graph again where we were, this is the standard intensive plasma exchange, alternate daily, three times a week, it's not working. This is the intermittent lipid apheresis we use while waiting for the Kanika. And when we start the Kanika therapy here, and subsequently the high dose methylprednisolone and oral prednisolone weaning schedule, by the end of the LDL apheresis therapy, although he was still in nephrotic syndrome, we'd had improvements in his urinary albumin, but we were able to come off all of supportive therapies. He didn't require the ultrafiltration anymore, and he didn't require the human albumin solution. And then we saw, within six to eight weeks of finishing the therapy, this late phase massive reduction in urinary protein levels and he went on to improve clinically after this and went into a full clinical remission. At the clinic at the moment he is on tacrolimus uh, MMF and five milligrams of alternate daily prednisolone. He's relapsed subsequently on a few occasions with febrile illnesses but each time he is steroid sensitive in this time. So we've taken someone who was completely steroid and CNI resistant and apparently seemed to have induced immunosuppression sensitivity. This case was reported this year as part of a, a case, uh, a series of seven cases in pediatric nephrology, along with some of Anya's cases. Um, and our American collaborators have seen the same kind of effects as well. So perhaps the only real original thing I've got to show you today is case number two then, because moving on from that, we start to wonder, can we do something different in stopping somebody get to the point of end-stage renal failure and transplantation? And the major a hurdle to doing this is the idea for a paediatric nephrologist to be putting central line access into a patient who hasn't got CKD, who's in a thrombophilic state. And I think that's the hurdle that we've had to immensely get over. However, in this case, it was easier because we had to. So we have here an 18-month-old female who presented uh, in the uh, middle of last year with her first episode of severe nephrotic syndrome. She was transferred, volume depleted, severe electrolyte disturbance and acute kidney injury with severe edema. She demonstrated primary steroid sensitivity. Um, she flirted with remission towards the end of the IV methylprednisolone, and as soon as the dose was dropped on oral, she relapsed again. Um, her biopsy, again, showed minimal change disease and nothing else of interest in the biopsy, and she commenced on cyclosporine as a second-line agent. She couldn't tolerate second-line immunosuppressive therapy agents. She had recurrent febrile illnesses, worsening albuminuria, and worsening edema. And we stopped all suppression in September of that year after a severe CMV viremia, transaminitis, and developing severe EBV viremia, which fortunately, uh, the CMV cleared with valgan cyclovir. But in December of that year, she was admitted with acute pulmonary edema secondary to a rhinoviral lower respiratory infection and ended up with central access because she was requiring so much albumin support and eventually machine ultrafiltration. So these two are quite unusual in that sense. And this slide, I just wanted to show you just the number of acute kidney injuries she suffered during that first period, just because she had such intense volume shifts. You know, her uh, clinical volume status at 9 a.m. was different to volume status at 5 p.m. on a daily basis. It was, it was one of the most severe nephrotic symptoms I've ever seen. And what we did with her, again, we had the central line access already. Um, that wasn't our decision to put that in to start that. It was already there because of her ultrafiltration, immunosuppression, and HAS requirements. So actually, it was a relatively easy thing to think about doing. We'd had a good experience with relative, well, no adverse effects. And so we felt we could try it on this patient. So you can see what happened there again. Within months of finishing the LDL apheresis therapy, she had monumental reductions in albuminuria to put her in a clinical remission and eventually into a full defined remission with the UPCR, which is in the normal range now. What she did do, again, like the other patient, every febrile illness she got a fever, she relapsed immediately. But fever, short course of oral methoprednisolone, responded. Fever, relapsed, responded this time. Fever, relapsed, responded. And just in recognition of the multiple 
episodes of steroid therapy, we reintroduced tacrolimus in, uh, to reduce the steroid burden. And on this occasion, it seemed to keep her in more prolonged remission, and she had a further febrile illness, relapsed, and has come back down now. So at the last clinic review, this child has got a urine protein creatinine ratio of 23. She's got a plasma creatinine of 20 and a serum albumin of around 30, so been up to 35, with a minimum tacrolimus level of 3.1 micrograms. So by using this adjunctive therapy, we seem to have demonstrated in a post-transplant rescue, in a pre-transplant episode, that we've been able to induce immunosuppression sensitivity to these patients. And certainly we seem to have um, stopped somebody going into end-stage renal failure, certainly now at least anyway, um, and all the um, socioeconomic and physical factors that go along with that. So they are my two cases for the moment. I'm just going to pass you over to Annie now, who's going to have a look at FSGS itself and some of the evidence for these therapies. Thanks, Dean. I think both Eva and Dean have very much illustrated how difficult these uh, patients are. And really, the ideal situation is that they never get there in the first place. So very much the practice in our centre is to try and ev do everything prior um, in the clinic when we first get the nephrotic syndrome, we first get these patients and try and prevent them from going there in the first place. I think actually also these cases and the four I'm about to present very much illustrate this is an umbrella diagnosis and it, I think as clinicians we need to be very conscious that we don't force a protocol onto the patient, we adapt the, the protocol to the patient, we don't do it the other way around because they're all slightly different and I think unfortunately just like pre-transplant, post-transplant there's probably a number of di different etiologies are, um, involved. So the patients I'm going to present have all gone through all the things that Dean and Eva have described already. They've gone through all the conventional treatment strategies and everything had failed such that they, when they came to us, they were probably about between four and six months on plasma exchange, plus or minus rituximab, plus or minus cyclophosphamide, and um, PCRs were still in the thousands. It, nothing was really working. And they were very much resistant to all treatments. Our first patient actually was um, probably the most successful one. She was, by the time she came over to us, she was about six months post-live related. She'd had plasma exchange, she had a plasma exchange resistant <coughs> FSGS recurrence. She'd had cyclophosphamide <coughs> and rituximab, both ineffective. She was kind of a potentially a candidate for circulating factor disease. There was some vague report of a partial resistant response to prednisolone, possibly putting her into a secondary steroid resistant category, but it was really difficult to tell. But certainly, uh, from early on, she was then multidrug resistant. And in common with some of the other cases, she had no detectable podocyte gene mutation. I think that's always a bit of a warning. If you have a patient, even if you have a patient who's multidrug resistant, including steroid resistance, you cannot pick up a gene. Always worry about the fact that there is a risk, increased risk of post-transplant recurrence. As she'd been through everything else and everything else had failed, we, the, the family requested liposorba. And so I got in contact with JJ Zaretsky, who I know quite well from previous life, and got in touch with Canico and brought it over. And we actually followed the rescue protocol that um, Dean describes, so very much three, twice a day LDLA phoresis. So switched directly from plasma exchange to L twice a week LDLA phoresis, followed by a six weeks initially initial course. We didn't actually give quite as much steroid as the protocol because I was a little bit worried about it, and she's also marginally hypertensive, and actually the only downside of the LDA phoresis, you cannot use ACEs, although you can use ARBs. So that's where the adult physicians struggle a little bit with it. However, you can use a Lasartan, you can use the, 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 that group of, of drugs. So we followed the res, uh, rescue protocol, but we used <coughs> one milligram per kilogram of prednisolone. But we did do the sort of 20 milligrams per, per kilo of solumedro for the first six weeks. And this is really her chart. Again, because we've gone through these cases a bit so far, um, you can see quite clearly that her protein creatinine ratio started to decline about, at about five weeks. And that's one thing you do see. You've got to set it out for three to four weeks before you see a response. I don't know why, but it may be that you've got a pool and you need to reduce it below a critical level. I'm waiting hypothesis, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, and then the peaks that you see there in the um, protein creatinine ratio are all infections. So in common, with Dean's patients, infections do set it off again. However, we persevered, and in fact, I really set a very arbitrary baseline of, I want our protein creatinine ratio down to below 300. So that's how we got to, and actually weaned the steroid quite rapidly thereafter. And in fact, again, the protein creatinine ratio continued to decline, and now almost two years down the line, her protein creatinine ratio is about 15, kidney function 
transplant function is completely normal, albumin's normal, and she's going out leading the life that, of a completely normal little girl. Um, our second patient was again a patient that came to us, I think it was probably about eight months post-transplant. Again, plasma exchange being marginally, she had responded to plasma exchange in the sense that it did improve her albumin, did improve her um, protein crack ratio, but the moment it was stopped, it shot straight back up again. So this was palliating, but not curative. Um, there was an additional problem of bone marrow kind of malfunction, normal bone marrow biopsy, but just some sort of issue that nobody really got to the bottom of. So she was GCSF dependent. This meant that we, she could not really have cyclophosphamide or rituximab um, safely, and in fact had had rituximab prior to going into renal failure and had been completely ineffective and she reacted it very badly. Again, she was not an obvious candidate for circulating factor disease. In fact, she'd been completely steroid and multi-drug resistant, and she had a primary FSGS, which was, from the initial biopsy at 18 months, looked very much like it might be a sort of developmental disorder. In fact, we chased the genetics very, very hard, didn't really come up with anything, because it, there was various um, features, such as embryonal glomeruli, tubular, da tubular changes, that really did look much more like a finished type or something. So we were very, I think there was a big surprise when she did relapse post-transplant, and again, at that stage, there really wasn't anything else on offer, so what do we do? We try liposorba. The first time we tried it, she got infection after infection after infection. We abandoned after a couple of months. It was just hopeless. It probably started to work, but then she was in such a state that we just had to give up. So the family went back to uh, their home country, went on to a course of plasma exchange, got the PCR back down to about 1,000 and returned. This time around, um, we had more challenges. We had liposorba started, but then the poor girl got BK. We reduced her immune suppression. She got acute rejection and then repeated infections. So in the end, we were propping her up with a cocktail of azithromycin and um, uh, immunoglobulins weekly, as well as modulating uh, immunosuppression to prednisolone. Um, and ESA and MMF. And because of that, really, I was a bit reticent to give her any more additional prednisolone. So we restarted liposorba without the additional steroid. And again, we, <laughs> more infections. So again, because we had nothing really, and, and we do learn from our patients, you know, in the, when you're really, you're up against the wall and what do you do next? So what we decided the only way we could do this was possibly to either increase the frequency of liposorba, which we did, and that had some sort of impact. And then I thought, well, let's try a bit of plasma exchange in between, really for no good scientific rational reason. And that did the trick. Um, I think the only thing that I can think of is that LDL is a shuttle molecule within the lipid pathway. So we're possibly taking out one thing that's water soluble, one thing that's lipid soluble, but equally it did work. The combination worked a lot better. And then she had that for four months. They had to go back home. And in fact, she's continued to improve. She's now down to once times a week plasma exchange and very well. And there's a, the next step will be to stop um, plasma exchange altogether. And again, there seems to be a delayed response. You know, we stopped the LDA phoresis some months down the line. Things were sustained. This is again her PCR. I don't have um, the data from, from now, but certainly the um, first arrow was when she started liposorba then we had to stop and then we started again and then the red arrow is where we started uh, liposorba plus plasma exchange and she just continued to improve. Creatinine is now very good and the plasma albumin also um, improved. Our third patient, again, was a bit of a surprise when she relapsed post-transplant, completely multi-drug resistant and her initial biopsy showed diffuse mesangial sclerosis, which traditionally is a congenital nephrotic syndrome. Um, no gene mutations, no family history. Again, I've whole genome screened her, I've whole exome screened her. I've got mum and dad, I've got a trio. I can't find anything. It's possible it's in the non-coding region. I don't know. But anyway, she had a deceased donor transplant and again, relapsed shortly afterwards and then was at eight months plasma exchange resistant on three to four plasma exchanges a day, which really is not a life. She had an initial response to liposorba, but I'm Unfortunately, I think over time, it, it, it's a complex social situation with the family, and we were reduced down to one times a week liposorba, which certainly for the initial period was as good as plasma, four, four times a week plasma exchange. She got her life back. 
the additional compounding comorbidities, this um, little girl became morbidly obese. And certainly on repeat biopsy, she has FSGS. And I'm, I think probably one of the secondary causes of post-transplant recurrence is actually a metabolic syndrome. And I suspect that's probably the bigger component here. So at one point, we were using liposorbital to keep her cholesterol down. Um, she's now come off liposorbital. She's sort of lingering along. But I think she's certainly one patient that we would consider preconditioning were we to transplant again. because. She recurred once, she'll do it again. One thing we were very keen on trying to do is give cyclophosphamide on the premise this must be some sort of gene mutation. Is this an antibody-driven thing? But the, the family refused So we uh, until it was really too late, so we, we couldn't go there. <coughs> Our fourth patient is very much like EFIS. Um, MPHS1 mutation, first graft, not a problem. Second graft, um, she relapsed. Um, again, we presume this is an antinephrine antibody. It's very difficult to measure them. And I, I also presume that because she had a live related with the first transplant. So likely a, what's called a haploinsufficient graft. So one of the nephrine proteins would have been normal. One would have been abnormal because her father would have been a heterozygote for the um, NPHS1 mutations that she has. And again, we tried plasma exchange, didn't really work. Rituximab didn't work, but cyclophosphamide was very effective. And at the time, we consulted the Finnish um, team that pretty much described this and their attitude is very much do what you can <laughs> and something might work um, so again I think it just illustrates how hopeless this, these, these patients can be and you've just got to try what you can because you have no other option if you don't treat um, it's not going to end well so really the very much the concept of post transplant recurrence at the moment is that you've got your genetic, which are likely low risk, and you've got your circulating factor, which to which I suppose the um, secondary steroid resistant patients would fall into. But I don't, I mean, increasingly, it's not really that simple. So I think now very much the thinking is becoming that you've got a genetic, you've got the genetic patients, you've got the circulating factor, but there is an intercept of multidrug resistant yet relapse post transplant. So presumably there's some predisposition to nephrotic syndrome but on top of that, these patients, for whatever reason, are multidrug resistant. There are a number of potential therapeutic targets, pre and post. Um, I won't go too much into the science because we're probably running out of time a little bit. And I'd, I think it's a, a forum for discussion, really. But um, when we look at all the sort of things we throw at these patients, there's a lot of different parts of the potential pathogenic pathway they may work. And they're probably. It, probably hitting the pathway in num a number of different areas could be successful, but I think also because we've got a heterogeneous population, what works for one patient may not work for another, um, and you've just got to go through it in sequence and see, see what you can do. Um, comparisons with abatacept, um, this is a, a patient that, abatacept is very commonly used in the, in the US. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be too successful, and this is a patient who had a batacet, but then went on to LDA phoresis, and that was more was successful. Again, this is from a paper. Um, very few people, bar the original people who published the abatacet paper, um, have been able to recapitulate the data. The other molecule of the moment at the moment is SUPAR. I mean, for me, this very very first slide is a problem because actually. As we know, M minimal change and FSGS are probably on a spectrum of disease. So you'd expect the SU part to be raised in N minimal change as well as FSGS. So quite how the data was done, how it, nobody really knows. However, what is reliable is that nobody can recapitulate the data. Um, and in fact, there's a, a, some people do use um, protein column A immunoabsorption and they have induced remission, and SU part is not removed. And in fact, SU part expression may be just non-specifically increased in the setting of a low GFR. And uh, that's really, I thought at this point we should open it to discussion. Thank you really to all three of you, Eva, Dean, and Anya. I know there's probably a lot of questions, but also a lot of colleagues who might want to share their experience. So it's now open for discussions. Yes, Ian. Well, I've just been live streaming with Ben Reynolds in the bus. So um, we've had five cases just recently. Unfortunately, the first one 
um, immediate graft loss, almost like the, the case you described. Um, we've treated three of them with ofatumumab, um, two of which was were very successful. They've now got good PCRs, normal ambulance. The most recent one, he relapsed almost immediately. Um, we plasma exchanged them, we gave him ofatumumab, and interestingly, he has become steroid responsive with regard to his function, but not with regard to his albuminuria. And the question that I had was, do you think that this child, after being steroid unresponsive, now being steroid responsive, would benefit from um, the liposorber? And if so, how much does it cost? It's cheaper than Ofotumumab. I don't know, can you get it? Because I've actually got two patients and I'm having to do named patient basis because Novartis has pulled it out of the UK. So you're um, a very lucky man. We've got Italy. a stock. I think okay. we've got we've got five five vials left. It's um, our it's pharmacist has stored it. Yeah. But I think that's if you're stuck there, I'll give it a go. Um, with the caveats that Dean presented about the problems with you've got a patient who's potentially a bit hypercoagulable, you've got to put a line in. But I think because I'm a bit old and I've been looking after these patients for 20 plus years, in the days for before MMF, before tacrolimus, before rituximab or futumab, all the things that we have in our arsenal pre-transplant. And I have recently had a patient who actually did very, has done very well on a futumab, but developed anti-rituximab antibodies. And he was behaving just like in the old days where you absolutely could not stop this disease. Um, I think, unfortunately, if you can't stop it, there's only one outcome, really, and they become secondarily steroid resistant, they just stop responding and they end up with a transplant recurrence. So I suppose the choice is do you do it just before transplant or do you try now? And I think it's a very well tolerated um, procedure. It's cheaper than plasma exchange. Um, I think off the top of my head, I think the whole, I think plasma exchange was something, we cost it all up. It was something like 800 pounds a session. This is more like sort of four or 500. Depends who you look at um, and how many you do. But Kanaka is always, they're very approachable, they're very easy, they, I mean, pre-Brexit at least, they'll come over with their little machine from Germany, and they lend you the machine, you don't have to buy it, and then it's just the tubing, the cost of tubing that you, you have to pay for. Um, who, did, who, did, who, did, who did the training? Did um, the Kanaka come along and do it. Yeah. yeah. The guy comes with a machine and teaches, he's great. <coughs> and, and your protocol for doing it, so it's three times initially, twice a day, and then what do you do thereafter, once a week? Once a week, three to week. That's the standard US protocol. And again, that protocol has been made up throughout the year, pretty much based on some floating around protocols from previous trials. The biggest data flow comes from the Polaris trial in adults, which was done in Japan, and it was four to four stones in the first two episodes treated with a very, very similar protocol. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, a very similar protocol, and they reported kind of 40 to 60 percent partial and complete remission responses. Um, and so that's why that protocol was adapted and abbreviated from that with some steroid as well. Um, to your question, I've no experience of ofatumumab in this situation, but I'm, I'm hearing good things about it. We actually did a third um, liposorber in the northwest at Alder Hay Children's Hospital. We transplanted the patient who recurred literally on the table. Um, and um, they took him um, back after a while and wanted to do it uh, themselves, even we just started doing the session. And they did it alongside plasma exchange, like um, with ofitimumab, and he went into full remission after a little while. Um, yeah, so, um, but again, we, I suspect Kanika are going to do individual costings because it's not procured by the NHS at the moment. But we had a similar experience whereby it came out no more expensive than the session of plasma exchange the patient was already committed to. And the other thing I was going to say was is there any place for us? pulling the genetics for the patients that we've all seen with recurrence and actually looking at whether we do whole genome se sequencing and linkage studies in them. I'm probably, that's for me, that's actually what yes, I've done. Yes. <laughs> yeah. that's what, so I have actually whole genome sequenced these patients but I've only got five and so the more the merrier because Actually, as, as with anything in life, this is a rare disease with rare complication of rare disease. So, and actually, the, the most important is to also look at patients who don't recur post-transplant, which are generally the um, genetic, pure genetic types, and also to have the trios, have the parents and the child, because there's usually some difference, some subtle difference. But these are all 
drug, um, they, these are all, so I've screened, I mean, we screened clinically for the sort of 70 um, genes on the S, SR and S panel from Bristol, but I've then gone on to do whole genome sequencing. What I've restricted at the moment is looking at just at the exome, so I was, I've been looking for protein coding variants, but there's nothing to say that it won't be outside that, because certainly in the protein coding bits, I, I haven't we haven't really found anything robustly. And then uh, alongside DNA, we're also interested in uh, uh, RNA, <laughs> plasma, and any tissue that you've biopsied. Um, and in particular, the jack stat pa pathway at the level of the tissue we're very interested in pursuing. Well, you that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just had a quick question back to you about the rationale for ofatumumab over rituximab. Okay. Yeah, because there's um, I, were you at Itna this year? I mean, th there's a, I guess, a lack of consensus amongst us all uh, that it is a superior B cell depleting agent for recurrent FSGS. Again, there's been a trial that's had to be terminated early in Italy. Um, showing a lack of efficacy with, you know, between 13 patients. Uh, the argument, however, is that it was a lower dose, 1,150 milligrams per meter squared. So a second question I had for you is what dose you used, if you can remember? Uh, I don't know, I'll find out. Yeah. The other thing is, though, it's a, as you said, it's a heterogeneous disease. Yes, it's yes. Say, okay, thanks. So, so I had a question to the three of you about exactly that. Um, so on rituximab, um, uh, there's efficacy in some patients. There is lack of efficacy in others. Um, I think the Mayo did a, did a study many years ago looking at rituximab pre-transplant in terms of recurrence, showing no, no significant effect. Um, it'll deplete your B cells very quickly, but we know that it has minimal effects on your antibody levels. Um, so it may have um, some benefit in terms of T cell activation. Not quite sure what the relevance of that is here. Um, and it's being used in the context of a number of other therapies at the same time. Um, and if, if you look at the antibody incompatible transplant protocols, many of them included rituximab early on, and it's come out because people thought, well, actually, are we sure that it's doing anything? And the answer was probably not. So, do you think we can justify using B cell depletion, and if so, why? I must admit, it's never worked in our hands, so I'm not sure. I mean, Avutumumab has a higher binding affinity because it's a humanized monoclonal, so it's actually got better binding affinity to the receptor. It binds deeper, it binds longer, it's got a different epitope. So, I can see why it works in the steroid sensitive. I think the only justification for rituximab is if you've got the occasional patient that's secondarily steroid resistant that you've just missed because the history is incomplete, it's a late diagnosis. So these guys are probably a B cell driven disease that attacks the podocyte. And if it all goes horribly wrong, you end up with a post-transplant recurrence. But I think that's the only justification because we did, I think the last time we had one of, apart from one, one the, this multi-drug resistant, the last secondarily steroid resistant patient we had that went wrong was about 2004. And she did respond to rituximab before I think Chris did some heroic protocol with plasma exchange and um, you may know the patient. Um, and she has never relapsed again, having relapsed on the table with the first graft in 2005. But that's the only instance I can think where it worked. Um, but I don't know the details because it was before my time. Well, I guess the one thing we do know about rituximab, it's incredibly effective in the pre-transplant station setting for steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. So we've, I mean, it's one of the best drugs we have um, to prevent recurrences and recurrent relapses. And then just the only other thing to say, I guess there's a lot of, there's two papers you were 
part of one of those with Andre, where um, we know that tissue resident B cells can be a source of interleukin-4, which stimulates jak -Stat, and whether we're using enough of, uh, enough of a dose. So for example, in lupus, Steve, you might want to comment on this, where you use two doses two weeks apart um, to get good tissue penetration. So maybe we're not using it enough. And then just a third point, um, Nizam, I completely agree with you about the ABOI incompatible transplant setting, because what was really interesting for me to learn as a medical colleague was in the context of um, an anti-B mediated post-transplant rejection, even though the patient had been preconditioned with rituximab, clearly those memory B cells were still ab able to come out of nowhere <laughs> and generate an anti-B, and I suspect that's what's happening in, in recurrence as well. So a multi-pronged approach is what's advocated by Virginia Savin, which we do. We remove the circulating factor, we target the source. Whether we were targeting the tissue resident B cells enough, we don't know. Thank I was you. just going to say to myself, I'm a bit conflicted. I think we've got a bit of cognitive dissonance because I don't think the literature is there in steroid resistance for rituximab worldwide, but there are clearly some people it may do something for. So why would we think it would be effective in the most difficult cases going towards transplant? I don't know, but it, it feels biologically plausible, and we don't know if this is just B cell mediated circulating factors. No. So, Yelena knows I always misbehave, so I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. Um, that protocol that's put up there with Zaritsky had 20 milligrams pulsed intravenous methylprednisolone weekly. That's equivalent to 25 milligrams orally, or about 3.5 milligrams per, um, per day in addition to your two milligrams per kilogram oral, we do not use, and that's for six weeks, we do not use those steroid doses for lupus nephritis, vasculitis, crescentic nephritis, and here you are using them for six weeks, and I hear you said that you didn't want to, and you, you reduced them. But how do we not know that it's just the steroids, and okay. we're not using enough steroids for higher dose? Case two didn't have steroids. Yeah. They didn't have additional steroids. It was case one where I reduced it. Case two didn't have any additional mm -hmm. steroids. So, so I think the protocol has to change. It's too, it's too steroid. The reason toxic. that was developed is that the original FDA protocol actually was. Um, so this is the rescue protocol. So the original protocol was developed without steroids. So JJ got all the patients that had failed the first protocol, and then did a rescue protocol where he added in steroids as well, and that's. That's what, what happens. So when you're faced with a very high-risk patient and you think, do I have nine weeks? That's why, I suppose, with the first patient, we ended up doing the steroids. But the second patient, we couldn't really give steroids, so we didn't, and it still worked. Whether that's a good enough answer, I don't know. Again, four patients, or we presented, what, six patients. Rodney's got some in Southampton. There's one down in Plymouth. You know, there's 10 patients in the whole country. Small end number. I shared these concerns about the steroids. Um, the patients, the patients. I tolerated it rather well, should I say. There was some hypertension that was relatively easy treated. Um, but most of these patients have been through five doses of 15 to 30 milligrams per kilogram of pulse methylprednisol as part of the original protocol and then weaning down steroids after that. This wasn't massively dissimilar to the, the original um, onslaught of immunosuppression. And if we felt we'd done enough to sensitize them, we felt that we just had to flood them to get them back. It didn't feel, on risk-benefit, it felt like the right thing to do. And also, the, the problem with the literature in this entire field is it's so muddy, and the amount of protocols and immunosuppression regimes is so different, and there's such clinical heterogeneity in the patients. You almost can't compare one study to the next. The adult studies include IgA, HSP, C3, nephrotic syndromes, and it seems to have some general effect by treating the dyslipidemia. And so we thought, if we just compare ourselves with the American trial data and harmonize our protocol as much as we can with them, we'd have something meaningful and comparable, even if it was only small numbers, which all of this will be. So did you give the five and a half milligrams per kilogram per day? Did you do that in the six weeks? We gave um, 20 milligrams per kilo pulse methyl pred from week three, once a week, so six doses of that. And we gave two mix per kg, so near enough round. Yeah, so yeah. Five and a half milligrams per kilogram Yeah, we did do that, yeah. I have one comment and one question about the rituximab. We had the best result in the child who didn't get rituximab. He came into remission. He came into remission with plasmapheresis, immune absorption, uh, no steroids, MMF, tacrolimus, and ACE and ARP. And the others 
three. They all had reduction up and we didn't uh, receive uh, for, uh, achieve uh, remission. But my question is, where, when did you start with ACE and ARP in, in your, all your patients? Or because I early after transplantation? I started after the therapy had discontinued. I felt it was too much of a risk of bradykinin release syndrome at the time. But you can have, I think, an ACE dose within 20, you have to stop it 24 hours before the apheresis session. And you can go back to, it. Oh, I didn't see the point, And we just started it afterwards. Um, but you can use ARBs, apparently. Yeah. We, we have so also not before the LDL? You didn't give the Asian no, no. hmm. we I think one of the patients had been on a maximal dose ACE prior to, to trying this. It was, you know, it was like shoveling snow in a storm. It did nothing to the proteinuria. 